Hello everyone, welcome to Baiju's Exam Prep IAS. Today in this session we are going to discuss the daily quiz for 8th February 2024. But before we begin, a quick reminder, if you are somebody preparing for UPSC civil services and you need some guidance, we are here to help you. You can fill the form that's given in the description below and our experts will get in touch with you. So let's begin with the session with the first question of the day. And this first question is about academic bank of credit. Which of the following statements best describes the academic bank of credit? Now, why this question? Because this is an article which was there in yesterday's PIB. Now, this was published in PIB about academic bank of credit. Now, with regards to the academic bank of credit, what we see is they are coming with a motto of one nation, one student ID. Where the entire idea is that for every student, there should be a student ID and there should be a repository, a digital repository, which is going to have all the information about their academics, all the academic credit that they have earned over the years throughout their academic career, everything will be stored there. So that's why it also gets very easy for them to get admitted somewhere. You, they don't have to run around with their documents here and there. The chances of losing out documents, etc. will also be minimized. So there are all these benefits that we will have and this is exactly the motive with which this digital repository has been launched. So this is something that was in the news. So this is, that's why just remember, a digital repository to designed to store students' academic credits and personal information. Now, with regards to this, what we see is that they are looking to create a single unique ID which will be able to have all the academic information for any given student. Now, if you look at the question, question has four options. The first is, it is a physical bank where students can deposit and withdraw academic credits. Sounds absurd, should not be the correct answer. The second statement, ABC is a digital repository that stores students' academic credits and personal information. Now this looks to be correct. Let's hold on to this. C says it is an online platform exclusively, exclusively for postgraduate students to store their research credits. Now we did not discuss anything as such that it's only about undergraduates or postgraduates or school level. It is for the academic career of any student. So that's why and the word exclusively in most of the cases when you have these kind of extreme words the chances are that these are wrong statements so this should also be wrong last statement it is a financial institution offering loans and grants based on the academic performance of students now nothing to do with that what we discuss is that it will be more about a repository for all the academic credits and personal information of a student so that's why the correct answer here will be B. Moving on, question number two. Which of the following statements best describes the objective of the Prithvi scheme? Now, with regards to this Prithvi scheme, we see that this is something which very recently has been launched by the Ministry of Earth Sciences. And this is what exactly this scheme is. We are talking about Prithvi Vigyan scheme. Now, this also was there in PIB yesterday. Now, with regards to this particular scheme, there are five sub schemes that we have and all these will together cater to the requirements of the Ministry of Earth Sciences. Now, overall, when we see these are the sub schemes that they have taken as a part of this particular scheme. But just remember that uh, these sub schemes may not be important. I'm sure that they're not going to directly ask a question based on these sub schemes, but rather based on the objective of the overall scheme. Now, when we look at this Prithvi Vigyan scheme here in this particular scenario, the basic objective that we are looking at is to understand the earth sciences better or understand the earth system sciences better addressing all the different components that we have regarding the earth sciences. So whether it is about cryosphere, biosphere, hydrosphere, so each and every component will be taken care of by this particular scheme. So that's why everything with regards to the studies that are required to understand the earth systems, all these things will be studied as a part of this particular scheme. So this is exactly what the idea behind this scheme is. So if you look at the options given, the first is to exclusively enhance the technological advancements in the field of geology and seismology. 
Second is to focus solely on atmospheric research and its implications on climate change. The third is to improve understanding of Earth's system sciences by addressing all five components, all the five components of the Earth's system and to provide reliable services for the country. So that's why here this is correct because when we say five components, we are talking about the components of air, water, land, biosphere altogether, cryosphere also included. So that's why all five included, hence this is what the correct answer should be. So C is the correct answer and again option D also is not related to this particular scheme. So there were two schemes which were in the news in PIB of yesterday's edition. Now question number three. Consider the following statements regarding retail inflation in India. Now why this question? Because of this particular article that we had in today's Hindu newspaper. Now the article basically says retail inflation likely eased in January. More or what we are basically saying is that overall when it comes to the retail inflation, we have seen that there has been some ease in retail inflation in the month of January 2024 as compared to December 2023. Although when we are looking with regards to the similar months last year, we see that there is an increase that we have seen. So if you compare January 2023 to January 2024, then in that case, the article says that there has been a slight increase. But if you consider uh, December 2023 and January 2024, then in this month, there has been a decrease. So that's why it is talking about a likely ease in the retail inflation. Now, in case of retail inflation, this question that we have right here is related to retail inflation altogether on all the indicators which are related to retail inflation. So there, there are three basics that we are talking about. That first, what is retail inflation? Second, what do we mean by consumer price index? And then we are talking about the wholesale price index. So something that commonly we call as CPI and WPI. Now with regards to CPI and WPI, understand as indicators what they mean and why they are important for economy. CPI or consumer price index is the measure of all the goods and services which are commonly consumed by us. For example, the vegetables that you commonly buy or anything in grocery shopping that you regularly do or your basic activities even including all the healthcare activities transportation, each and everything, even the leisure activities, for example, if you're going to a movie, even that will be counted. So when you count all the goods and services, the prices of all the goods and services, this is what the consumer price index or CPI will try to measure. So overall for the end consumer, what is the price that the end consumer is paying? And if there is an increase in the payments that you are doing for all these goods and services, it would simply mean that there is a higher inflation because you are paying more than you were paying. So that's why now you are saving less. So that's bad for the economy because you're not saving enough. So that is what consumer price index will try to measure. So just remember everything commonly that you buy or any service that you commonly use. Each and everything will be a part of CPI or consumer price index. Whereas in case of WPI, we are talking about the wholesale price index, meaning that before it goes to the retail, before it goes to the end consumer, what is the price at that level? This is what the WPI is going to measure. Now understand how these two things can be different. Just take any commodity, for example, or any food item that you buy. Suppose rice, all right? So rice coming from the agricultural fields and then processing and then finally landing at the stores. But before it is being sold to the end consumer, the stores that you have, let's say we are talking about any uh, supermarket, all right? So in a supermarket, they might have stored, let's say 100 kgs of rice. So out of these 100 kg of rice, you are going to buy 1 kg, 5 kg, 10 kg and so on, correct? So when you are buying, you are going to pay something which is the end user is paying, correct? Now in this regard, suppose for this supermarket, suppose that there are two supermarkets, let's say S1 and S2. These are the two supermarkets. Now both of them are buying rice from the same source. And let's say they are buying rice 
for let's say rupees 40 per kg right so they are buying for rupees 40 per kg so let's say they had 100 kgs that they bought so overall if they have bought 100 kgs then in that case they have paid this much so they have paid 4000 and even the second store has paid the same 4000 but let's say the first store is selling this rice for rupees 80 per kg and the second store is selling the same for rupees 100 per kg so for the consumer this is where the prices are different at wholesale level the prices may not be different but at the end level at the end consumer level it could be different so that's why consumer price index becomes very very crucial as an indicator of inflation more than WPI, CPI will be more important. So let's look at all these three statements. First statement is retail inflation in India is primarily measured by the consumer price index. Second is wholesale price index is the main measure used by the Reserve Bank of India for formulating monetary policy. Now this is where this is wrong because it will be CPI. They will be taking the measure of the CPI because this is what the exact measure of inflation would be and hence to formulate any monetary policy, the RBI has mandated that they are going to use CPI. It was in 2014 that they had mandated that they are going to use CPI. So that's why and why CPI because it is what affects the end consumer and also because when it comes to WPI, WPI is only about goods. Whereas CPI will be an indicator of all the goods and services, all the goods and services that the end consumer is bothered about. So even that's why I said that even leisure activities, your transportation, your food, your healthcare, each and everything will be taken into account in CPI but not in WPI where you only take into account the goods. So that's why CPI is a better measure so to say. The third statement High retail inflation leads to an increase in the purchasing power of consumers. Now, high retail inflation cannot increase the purchasing power, correct? It will decrease the purchasing power because retail inflation is high means that you have to pay more. So if you have to pay more, your paying capacity will decrease, your purchasing capacity will decrease. So it's just the opposite. It will not increase, but rather it would decrease. It would decrease. So that's why this is also wrong. So only first statement is correct and the question has asked how many of the above gi statements given above are correct. So only one statement is correct. That's the first statement. Moving on, the next question. Consider the following statements regarding the significance of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius above the pre-industrial levels. Now, this is something that is being constantly discussed and I would say that this is one of the most important topics right now not only from prelims perspective but also from mains perspective that the temperatures crossed more than 1.5 degrees Celsius for the whole of 2023 and even last month January was the hottest January on record ever according to scientists and this is something that was published in the down to earth website today. This I have taken from down to earth and this was published in on the website today. Now, when it comes to this 1.5 degree Celsius, two indicators, 1.5 degree Celsius increase from the pre-industrial levels and two degree Celsius from the pre-industrial levels. These are very, very important indicators because the scientists and a lot of studies that have been conducted on global warming, they've all suggested that if the global rise in temperature is above 1.5 degrees Celsius from the pre-industrial levels, meaning since the industrial activity is like after in industrial revolution started. So if you consider the pre-industrial levels, if the, pri uh, if the rise in temperature goes beyond 1.5 degrees Celsius from that level, then in that case, it is going to be a very dangerous scenario for this entire earth. And everywhere on this earth, we are going to see effects of that. And if it goes beyond 2 degrees Celsius, then the effects are going to be permanent and it's going to be almost impossible for us to reverse those kind of changes. Now, when it comes to these changes, what kind of changes are we talking about? We have seen so many extreme weather conditions now. Whether it is about cyclones on our eastern coast or the droughts in Maharashtra or whether you are talking about the melting of the Himalayan glaciers, 
weather uh, when you talk about the weather patterns that have changed we talked about and we have been discussing about how this winter has been snowless for the northern mountains whether in kashmir or whether in uttarakhand or in himachal pradesh we have seen that the onset of snow has been very very late so all these things whether it is about the changes in the weather pattern whether it is about all the extreme weather conditions not only in india but across the world whatever we have seen all these things are indicators whether it's about the hurricanes whether it is about the droughts whether it about it is about the uh, arctic areas where the melting of the snow ice caps have been happening so each and everything is an indicator that how there is a permanent change happening and this going further will lead to a lot of permanent damages for example if the things continue in this manner you are going to lose all the corals we are probably going to lose uh, in uh, the sundarbans in the bay of bengal area in bengal we are going to lose probably the polar bears in the northern ice caps so there are a lot of i mean these are just a couple of examples to list a lot of micronesian uh, countries in the pacific they are just going to vanish because of the sea level rise that will happen a lot of coastal cities all across the world are going to vanish because of the this climate change so there are a lot of permanent changes that could happen if we do not take immediate action so that's why these indicators of 1.5 degree celsius and 2 degree celsius especially they become very very crucial for us to understand and start taking mitigation steps as quickly as possible now look at these three statements the first statement says limiting global warming to 1.5 degree celsius is expected to significantly reduce the frequency and intensity of the extreme weather events compared to a 2 degree celsius warming scenario that's correct as i told you that with 2 degree celsius the temperature or any changes will be even more permanent in nature second statement says warming limit of 1.5 degree celsius is crucial for the survival of coral reefs again something that we just discussed and it substantially lowers the mass bleaching events in these kind of ecosystem so this is also correct the third statement says the explicitly explicit goal of keeping the increase in global average temperature to well below 2 degrees celsius above pre industrial levels while pursuing efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees celsius was formally introduced and agreed upon for the first time in the earth summit of 1992 now this is wrong because in earth summit we started talking about global warming and where do we need to limit this temperature change but the major discussions and the major decisions that were taken and the goal that was kept was actually during the paris climate summit this was during the paris climate summit or agreement of 2015 so this is where we saw that there was a push from a lot of pacific island countries also and that is also some something that started to ensure that this 1.5 degree celsius also is included in all the official documentation that were being signed so that's why it was not earth summit 1992 but it was about the paris climate summit of 2015 so that's why this third statement is wrong so only two statements are correct that is uh, correct answer will be b moving on the next question india is an important member of the international thermonuclear experimental reactor if this experiment succeeds what is the immediate advantage for india now why i have taken this question because we have seen that very frequently something like this has been in the news where we are talking about how fusion is now a success that we have achieved a breakthrough the question the news have been coming since december 2022 december 2022 then august 2023 and then again in february 2024 the same news about how we have achieved a breakthrough where we have been able to produce more energy from fusion than the energy that we consumed in operation this is something that we have achieved for the first time and we have been able to re repeat these uh, experiments and we have been successful in all these repeats as well and this is exactly what we are talking about that it can help in producing a practical fusion reactor for the future and this is something that was this was an article in the financial express now related to that i've taken this question which was asked in your 2016 prelims paper talking about international thermonuclear experimental reactor now this is a reactor that is being built in france 
and India is a very very important member of this ITER where apart from India you also have the European Union, you have the US, you have Russia, Japan and then China and South Korea. So overall there are seven member countries including India. Now out of these seven member countries, all member countries are contributing something or the other to this. India has been contributing the uh, uh, some of the very very important parts like the cryostat has been given by India. So overall when it comes to this, this is basically to build a future with nuclear fusion. Now look at the options given. First is it can use thorium in place of uranium. Both uranium and thorium are related to nuclear fission, not fusion. So that's why this is wrong. Can attain global role in satellite navigation, nothing to do with satellite navigation. Can drastically improve the efficiency of the fission reactors. Again, we are not talking about fission, so that's wrong. It can build fusion reactors for power generation. This is correct, that we are talking about how the future can be built with nuclear fusion. Now lastly, let's look at the fact of the day. And this is a very peculiar concept called as Pineapple Express. Now this Pineapple Express has been in the news for the last one week. And this has been in the context of some very heavy rainfalls that are expected and happening in the western coast of the US. Now, here we are talking about this particular article, for example, which was there in the print. California's atmospheric river delivers torrential rain and fierce wind. Now, there are this there is this concept called as Pineapple Express that we are talking about. But let me be a bit greedy and talk about not one but two concepts simultaneously. The concepts one that we have listed here, Pineapple Express, and then something which is called as Atmospheric River. Now first let's try to understand what is Atmospheric River and then what is Pineapple Express which is a concept based on Atmospheric River. Now when we are talking about an Atmospheric River, the meaning of Atmospheric River is just imagine a river, alright? How you know that if you have a river which is delivering a lot of water. So similar to how a river would deliver a lot of water, a lot of flow of water will happen. Similarly, when we say atmospheric river, we are talking about a condition where we are talking about just like a river stream which is built in our atmosphere in the clouds. Where instead of water running through this atmospheric river, you have vapor which is running. Water vapor which is running starts from the tropical waters and goes towards the poles. So this is how it starts to go. Now as it starts to move and as it goes towards the land, from the sea when it moves towards the land, it carries a lot of moisture and then the landfall happens wherever it touches land. Now in this kind of landfall, depending on where the landfall is happening, it could either lead to huge rainfall, a lot of rainfall or if it is in the colder areas, then it can lead to a lot of snowfall as well. So it can cause flooding, it can cause a lot of havoc in all these kind of areas. Now, this is that's why this is called as an atmospheric river. So the image that you see right here on your screen, this is how uh, we see that the atmospheric river, something like this will be delivering all the moisture towards land. Now in this regard, when this atmospheric moisture or atmospheric river carrying all this moisture is never near the Hawaiian region, then in that case it has been named as Pineapple Express. Now why the name Pineapple Express has been given is mainly because of the fact that Pineapple Express, Pineapple is a fruit which is always associated with the tropics and especially with the Hawaiian region. And that's why when the atmospheric river does a landfall in the Hawaiian areas, then in that case it is called as Pineapple Express. So that's why it's a specific type of atmospheric river that is well known for affecting the western coast of North America, particularly California up to through the Pacific Northwest. And this is where we see that there will be a strong persistent flow of the atmospheric moisture coming from the Hawaiian region, coming from the Hawaiian region and moving towards the west coast of North America. So that's why because of its association with the Hawaiian region, the origin being there, that's why it has been named as Pineapple Express. So it's nothing more than 
an atmospheric river meaning that a lot of moisture which is being carried in the clouds from these warm areas towards land so if they make a landfall in tropical or subtropical areas then it will lead to a lot of rainfall huge amount of rainfall and if in colder areas then it can also lead to a lot of snowfall as well so although these are related to disasters in a manner you can say these are disaster related to disasters but at the same time because of the warm nature of the current or the air that is flowing they can actually lead to a lot of melting of snow etc as well and they also feed the rivers uh, a lot of snowfall that happens usually we see that the snowfall would happen or let's say even uh, these all these conditions will happen during fall or maybe early spring so this is when it happens it's not a very uncommon phenomena but whenever it happens it can cause a lot of trouble but at the same time it also feeds the rivers it also leads to a lot of snowfall which will also keep on feeding the rivers all throughout summer so in that sense it also has some positive impact on the overall climate and overall weather patterns so this is about pineapple express the fact of the day so with this we come to the end of the session for today thank you very much for joining